Dr. Amelia Rossi is going to uh, give us a talk on their implementation of the public key infrastructure uh, that they have in their laboratory. Uh, Dr. Rossi received her uh, PhD in 1993 and uh, has been involved in uh, emergency response teams and was a, a delegate uh, to the Italian um, emergency response uh, team. She has held a number of positions, visiting positions, I guess all over the world. <laughs> well. <laughs> and uh, she has published many papers and is now uh, teaching at the University of Milan. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the Naval Postgraduate School for having us here. And today I'll tell you something about our work, this work with this joint work with Danilo Bruschi, whom some of you have listened to yesterday, and a former uh, master student of ours, Arianna Curti, who unfortunately decided to go for money instead of fame and glory in research. But um, she did this, uh, she's the one that did this, most of the work uh, that I'll be talking to you about. So it's mostly a performance evaluation study. Uh, we're not looking at security aspects of PKI in this, uh, in this talk. We're looking at performance evaluation. Uh, why? Because uh, public key infrastructures are somehow struggling to become uh, popular in the internet world. Uh, they are forced to become popular in countries like Italy, where there is a legislation that uh, legally recognizes digital signatures. And so people eventually, whether they like it or not, will have to move to uh, PKIs. And moving to PKIs, uh, of course, performance is going, to be, uh, is going to be an issue. What you'll see, what you'll hear about in this talk is briefly something about PKI, because I didn't know exactly how familiar you were with this. If you're very familiar, we can skip and forget it. Uh, X509, what it means to be X509 compliant. Um, something about certificate revocation protocols because they play uh, a critical role, especially for the user perspective. And then uh, we'll get into the main uh, issues of this, uh, the main topics of this talk, which is modeling a PKI, the results, and then what's left to do, which is a lot of work, so. <laughs> okay, so just quickly something about public infrastructures. In, we need a way to make sure uh, we have public key cryptography. Each one of us has a key pair. Uh, we need a way to guarantee the binding between uh, my public key and myself, basically. Public infrastructures can be, um, are the systems comprised of uh, policies, software, and hardware components that guarantee such a binding. They guarantee the authenticity of the keys, the ownership, and the validity of the keys. Uh, so they form, they, they implement uh, uh, organized trust relationships among users that don't know each other. It's, uh, it's like uh, public institutions that guarantee uh, for our IDs, although I may not know uh, any of you, but I see your IDs and I trust who you are because, uh, because you have a valid document. What are the components? I mean, the, the main thing that uh, somehow PKIs revolves, uh, uh, revolve around are the certificates. Certificates are uh, information, hold, uh, contain information about the keys that a user, uh, the key pairs a user have, users may generate uh, pu uh, privately a, pub a public private key pair or may go and have it generated by some other authority. Let's assume that they do it by themselves. And then they have to have uh, uh, some sort of certified binding between the public key and the information associated with this public key. The certificate is what guarantees this binding, and that what you see is like all the information that you see, uh, like information about the owner, who the certifier entity, entity is, uh, the validity of the certificate, what algorithm was used to sign the certificate, the signature itself uh, uh, on the certificate, uh, are some of the information um, that, is, that is present on uh, the certificate. So what are the main thing? The main thing is authenticity. Uh, guarantee that the, that the certificate is an authentic certificate that was issued by a given PKI. Uh, guarantee the binding between uh, the key and the certificate. 
So the person that owns uh, that key uh, to which the certificate is attached. And then the validity of the certificate. The validity of the certificate uh, guarantees us that those keys are still valid, can, can be used, and have not been revoked. If I trust something that has been revoked, clearly I may trust, it's like trusting a fake ID. And well, I won't just spend any time. Uh, we all know what it means, trusting a fake ID, and the consequences uh, uh, this may have. What are the components uh, that will focus, uh, uh, that are the components of the PKI, and that we will see in our model? The registration authority is a uh, component, a system component that, guarant that verifies uh, somehow with a different system outside the system uh, the, um, the user's identity. So if I make up, I, I generate my key pair, uh, and then I go to a registration authority, I say this is my key pair and this is my ID, my passport, my some other form of ID, my driver license, whatever. Uh, depending on the policies that the registration authorities implement. Um, and they distribute keys and certificates uh, and possibly also uh, interact uh, as a front end to the, to the CA, to the uh, certification authority. The certification authority is the system component that really does the critical work because it's the one that uh, digitally signs the, the, the certificates, is the one that guarantees the binding that the registration authority uh, has verified, and is the one that revokes uh, certificates uh, and that, again, uh, implement the trust between uh, users that don't know each other. Is this trusted third party uh, whose uh, security is uh, most critical in the system. How is all the information distributed? It's distributed through the directory that stores the certificates for everyone uh, that interacts with people using the PKI uh, to um, uh, download and verify the status, collect all the status information, and um, through using, this, uh, using the LDAP, uh, LDAP protocol. What we, uh, and then another important component, of course, is the end users. End users may be people that uh, want to validate, uh, they want to validate the certificates or software components of other applications that uh, interacts uh, with, um, with other applications that exchange uh, certificates. We are probably all uh, used now to our browser downloading certificates or having a certificate so that we can access some, uh, some sites in a safer way, in a more secure way. Um, people or software application may or may not have software or hardware devices for, uh, to do all the cryptographic uh, activity. And this is part uh, that we're really not uh, interested in because the end user performance are not an issue of the whole system because every end user has his own system that um, is basically uh, an isolated system. It interacts with the, uh, with the rest of the world, but its performance is just, are just local. What we are interested in is the performance of the system that allows us to sign, uh, verify the signatures, uh, uh, register users, registration authority, and of course uh, the, the directory. So the functionalities, just to summarize, are what you see listed here. So we have uh, issuing certificates, distributing them, that means making them publicly available, um, making publicly available the information about the status of those uh, certificates in various ways, uh, creating certificate revocation lists or with other uh, protocols, as we will see and possibly also uh, publishing, making known to the, uh, the users, all the users, the policies that are adopted uh, to run the PKI. So for issuing certificates to register, uh, for registering uh, users and, and so on. So in this, uh, in this wonderful picture, you, can, uh, uh, you see how the components, the various components interact. We have the certification authority, uh, end user, okay, let's start from end users. End users talk to the registration authority, which is optional. There are systems where you may just go and talk directly to the CA, but
but it might be uh, more convenient to have uh, the registration authority explicitly. So they uh, submit their request for certificates or requests for revocation. Suppose that, uh, imagine that I have my key pair and then somehow I lose the uh, passphrase to access my private key. My, uh, my, my key pair is useless. I need to revoke that the certificate. And I need to have another key pair, so I may send the RA a revocation request. Um, all these uh, transactions uh, are signed in the sense that they are in order to guarantee their, uh, their origin. So if I send a request, I'll sign the request. The same thing does the RA, same thing is the CA when it talks back to, when it re uh, replies to the RA, uh, either issuing a certificate or uh, making, distributing uh, revocation, uh, revocation lists, which are um, in the directory, which are uh, stored in the directory together with the, the certificates that people may want uh, to download in order to be able, yes. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> you can't sign it anymore, but um, you may be able to use another key like that you have for, uh, for instance, for encryption, and you may, be you may have like different set of keys to do different operations, and because you've lost the one for signing, you may send something uh, encrypted with your private encryption keys and use that as a, as a guarantee for uh, your identity somehow. This is part of, of the policies that the, that the PKI uh, defines uh, so that you know as a user what to do in, uh, in these cases. But let's say that like this aspect of how is, uh, it's clearly a, a security issue which uh, doesn't really affect a lot performance in, in our perspective in this case. But it's clearly, uh, you have a good point there. Um, okay, then uh, we have interaction between the registration authority and the directory when uh, a user requests, uh, for instance, uh, sends a revocation request or uh, a certificate request that will be uh, delivered to it through the, uh, through the array or directly accessing the, the directory. So keep this system in mind because uh, this picture in mind because uh, the directory, the CA, and the RA will be uh, the main components of our system that we will focus our performance analysis on. And the end user will just be uh, the flow of requests getting into the, getting into the system. So X509 is, is the authentication, is the standard protocol to offer authentication services in the X500 directory service. It's something, it's been adopted by most, the, the major uh, or most widespread PKIs like Netscape, the Visa, MasterCard, and Trust time, set, uh, time step. So it's, it's pretty popular and it should guarantee some, some kind of uh, interoperability between the, uh, between the PKIs. This uh, information that we have in the, uh, the information, how the information is organized in the certificate. So information, <clears throat> Um, sorry, the, the, the extension, the V3 extension allows, it, it's a um, change, modification of the original X509 uh, structure which was pretty rigid and uh, hierarchical and it's no longer that way so we don't need to have all these different levels of um, certification authorities like the root level, the internet policy registration, and then the policy certification authorities guaranteeing the individual certification authorities. We just have, we now have a flat structure where each CA is a root by itself, and they may talk to each other, they may uh, recognize each other directly through what's called the cross certification instead of having to go back to this uh, unique uh, uh, route for all the for all the certification authorities, together with a different structure, there is also a different structure of the certificate. More information. This is the information uh, already provided in uh, an X509 uh, certificate. So, of course, uh, 
the version and the serial number of the certificate in order to be able to quickly access and look for them. This, the key owner, the CA that issued the certificate, validity time, uh, um, the information about the key and the algorithm used uh, with it, algorithm used to sign and so on. Some extensions uh, in case uh, uh, also for the certificate, more information. Uh, for instance, uh, the information about the specific key that was used by the CA because the CA may have different keys to do different things and the same thing applies, for, uh, applies to the subject, so same uh, uh, type of info. Uh, possible uh, restrictions in the use of the key that goes together with the previous, previous piece of information. Um, and then some more, uh, some more details. Uh, this fact, I mean, the different shape of the, the different form, uh, format of the certificate doesn't really uh, change much into the performance of the, of the system, but it's just like the most popular now, so we, uh, this is what we consider. So uh, one thing that we said before is that certificates uh, have like a, usually a one year validity, but for some reasons we may uh, not be able to use those keys, the key associated with the certificate, so we need to revoke. Um, and so we need to know as users uh, that interact with other, with other users whether the certificate we have, we received, or that our partner, the other party in a communication uh, centers, it's still valid or not. So we need to be able to access status information about the certificate. Excuse me. Um, basically what we need to know is uh, whether a certificate is still valid or not. The easiest way, what people thought when they came up with the idea of PKI was, okay, we're gonna have the list of what was revoked of all the certificates that are not yet expired, but, are, uh, but have been revoked. What's in the certificate? So creating this certification revocation list, uh, what's in them? Okay, we have the serial numbers um, <clears throat> so that we can easily uh, find the certificate we're looking for. When the certificate was revoked, in order for us to be able to compare the time we did our transaction, for instance, and the time when the uh, certificate was revoked, the signature of the CA, uh, when the CRL was issued, when, so when the uh, information became available, and when the next uh, uh, information about revoked certificates will become available. CRLs don't grow infinitely. Why they don't grow infinitely? Although the size, their size is, uh, computed using this uh, uh, very simple equation which was estimated by in a which was estimated in a pretty famous report uh, uh, that came out in 94 by Mitre they say that every uh, CRL has 51 bytes header and then uh, it takes 9 bytes for each revoked certificate um, they don't grow infinitely, like I said before, because uh, once a certificate has, has expired, there's no reason to keep it in the, in the, in, uh, the CRL anymore, because anyway, um, it wouldn't be valid. So that allows us to keep the size of the CRLs uh, under control. The fact that they don't grow infinitely uh, has some advantages because uh, the CA, as we will see, uh, needs to do some work on the, um, on the certificate revocation on the CRL, like signing the CRL. So the bigger it is, the longer it takes. Uh, although it's not really a very big change because uh, you don't sign the whole thing, you sign the hash, and the hash is anyway uh, fixed uh, fixed size, but it takes a little longer to compute the hash. The certificate revocation protocols we have considered in our system are the two most, uh, the, the, the common ones, let's say. Periodic publication of uh, uh, CRLs with various mechanisms to update them, which could be uh, over issuing CRLs or a periodic publication of delta CRLs. Delta CRLs are differences of what we have so far, which is the full CRL, and the Delta CRL, which is what's been uh, revoked uh, since the last uh, generation of a full CRL. After so many uh, Delta CRLs uh, have been uh, issued, 
a new full CRL, including all that information, will be issued. But you should consider that issuing a CRL, a full CRL, is an operation that occurs like usually every four hours, is considered a common, uh, common practice. And Delta CRLs are usually published like every 10 minutes. If your uh, system is time critical in the sense that you really need to have very, very up-to-date information before you can perform any transaction and you can't wait until the next, uh, for the next 10 minutes in order to see the next uh, Delta CRL, well, this system is not really good for you. You need something else. Uh, what you may need is this other system, OCSP, that does, uh, they offers more timely information because uh, it queries the directory for Delta CRLs, and if it doesn't find in the, full, in the latest full CRL and in the latest Delta CRL available uh, the information about the certificate we, uh, you queried the system, the OCSP, then it will go and directly access the CA database to see if there is anything there that hasn't been published yet. So. Um, the user doesn't get to see the CRL directly, doesn't deal with the CRL directly, and it's, it's sort of working like, think about of a proxy, kind of a proxy uh, type of service. It does some stuff for you, uh, and it does it more efficiently because, of course, it's a centralized service. All of us, we don't need to uh, download all the CRLs and duplicate all this information all around the world. There is only one point that has it. Of course, being only one point is the usual trade-off between uh, um, the, the fact that it's a single point, both of failure and of uh, information distribution. So maybe be, uh, better, like a proxy, maybe more uh, prone to performance uh, problems. There are studies uh, of perform there are performance analyses on this type of protocols uh, that focus only on this type of protocols. Uh, that you see referenced here in a very short and short way. Cooper uh, is the author, and they were published in, uh, at AXAC, the um, uh, AXAC conference in 1999, and at the Information uh, Security and Privacy Conference in Oakland, IEEE, um, in 2000. This, uh, this analysis, uh, this performance analysis, focused, like I said, on the on just on the revocation system, on the revocation uh, strategies. Our analysis is different in the sense that we look at the whole uh, PKI system. What do we do then? Um, now that probably uh, you're halfway bored through like things that you probably knew already, uh, let's come to more uh, to the meat. Okay, we model a PKI, so what do we do? We um, identify who does what and how. What does that mean? We identify the uh, servers, possibly and the customers, so uh, CR, uh, CARA directory and the set of users. They do what? They do, we need to identify and define exactly how transactions are performed, which are the servers involved and for how long they work, so service demands. And possibly we also uh, investigate different policies for uh, revocation information management. This is the part that we'll see in the announcement of the model. So uh, there's not much to say about the actors because we've said things uh, about them already, CARA, directory and end user. Transactions, what are the transactions the CA performs? Uh, it's basically uh, it's uh, certificate issuance. The request for the certificate may be self-signed by the user or may be coming from the RA or it may be just a renewal request. Then uh, we have some load on the system due to cross-certification. Cross-certification is requests from another CA to um, sign its own certificate and it will go both ways so that whenever I received a, a, a certificate that is signed by another CA that mine recognizes all the, uh, the verification, let's say, is, is faster. And it's like we allow two PKIs to talk to each other. Then certificate revocation and publication of the CRL. The RA does much less because it just does uh, 
request uh, for new certificate or um, request for revocation, acting on behalf of the, of the user. Directory transactions, typical directory transactions, so search, modify, add and delete uh, the uh, items it has, the entries. What can users and users do? They can uh, request uh, a new certificate or revoke uh, uh, existing certificates, or they can request uh, to verify the status of a certificate they can uh, um, they may come to use. Um, in with this set, now let's see what. Like I said, we need to identify when we want to make a, to build a, a performance model, we need to identify, of course, like I said, the servers and the customers and what the customers do, request on each of the, in, on each uh, component of the system. So for our transactions, we see what they do and what they request. Like for instance, a self-signed certificate request um, the user, which is missing on the first line, on the second line, the user generates a request and protects it with a shared secret. At this point, the user is not yet certified. So we have this mechanism where often we need to have some sort of shared secret between the CA and the user so that the CA can verify that the user is exactly what uh, he claims to be and can then uh, so authenticate uh, the CA can then authenticate send the sender through the shared secret and then generate the certificate, insert it in local database, signs the reply and sends it to the user. Note that we're not going to go through all this because it's, it's pretty boring, but just to give you an idea, uh, there is some uh, uh, cryptographic ac activity in the first part. The CA has to do uh, signatures here and by sending it to the user, it also signs the message, so it will be two signatures that it has to do. Um, the user verifies the signature, which takes, doesn't, take, uh, doesn't take as long as signing, sends an act back to the CA, and then finally the CA uh, is able to publish the certificate in the directory. Uh, we can do this for like all the uh, various types of transactions, but it, it gets they're not really very much different in the sense that if it comes from the RA, is the RA that does the registration authority is the one that does most of the work instead of the on behalf of the user, but they're basically the same thing. Uh, so we can do okay this one, which is a little different. This one is uh, uh, no revocation is still the same. Is just uh, uh, just a little shorter. Revocations are faster. CRL generation, this one is different because it doesn't have anything to do with requests coming from the user. It's just a periodic thing that the, um, that the uh, certification authority does. It has to do some uh, database activity, reading the list of uh, certificates that it has uh, um, created so far. So preparing, generating the CRL and then uh, and the Delta CRL from from the local database, possibly generating new Delta CRL and then uh, signing it. So one signature. Remember this thing that it's the key thing, like how many signatures do I have to do in the transactions? So there is one signature and then uh, some database activity. Thing that we didn't look at, it's like in the revocation, again, in the revocation there are like uh, one signature again. Uh, one is on the RA side to sign the request or on the user side, and then uh, another signature on the uh, certification authority, and then some uh, communication. What do we use to model our system? We use queue networks. We use queue networks because they're very efficient to solve and the system wasn't too complex. Uh, we could solve it using both uh, analytical and uh, uh, simulations. Um, we usually like most of the times uh, in this case with this type of models we used uh, we have an exponentially distributed service times uh, and customer inter-arrival times assumption so what we assume is that services are uh, random basically uh, and the same thing is for customers for inter-arrival times of requests and the requests come from different sources have different 
uh, we'll see that they have different, um, different nature that will lead us to uh, both single class and multi-class uh, models. Mm, closed and open models uh, because we used a, a hierarchical approach. Uh, so we started first uh, each component in isolation with a closed model. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the behavior of that component was not, um, or was actually, uh, was or was not uh, load dependent. And then once we had those, that information, we moved to an open model where we have everything, the, the complete picture. That's why we have the component in isolation, then the complete model, and then the enhancement when we looked at some more, uh, um, at different types of revocations mechanisms. What are, uh, what are our objectives? Our objectives are bottleneck analysis, which means identifying right away, possibly with the minimum effort, um, what, the, what the critical resource is in the system. You know what the critical resource is in the system, you know that the system won't be able to perform any better than the best that resource can do. You can't do any better because that's the bottleneck. We want to see if the population mix which means uh, what percentage of like revocation requests, what percentage of generation requests, uh, and so on. Uh, if this uh, population mix has or hasn't an impact on performance, our performance metric in this study is response time. Uh, and we want to see what is the maximum arrival rate uh, that we can sustain, that the system can sustain uh, before response time goes crazy, goes berserk, goes, uh, becomes very high uh, and becomes unacceptable. And possibly uh, another objective is uh, what if analysis. What if analysis is something that allows you to say uh, without changing the system, what would happen if I change this parameter in my system? And the parameter could be either the population mix or uh, the system's uh, characteristics itself. Like, what if I had a faster RA? What if I had a, a faster CA? Does it help? Does it, it's completely useless. This is the type of analysis that we would like to do. Some assumption, what we do is like we have uh, a dedicated cryptographic processor to do all the, sign uh, the signing activities and we do pretty big signatures like tw um, 248, 2048 bit RSA signatures, MD5 hash, uh, um, the queries to the database, uh, the local certificate database by the CA are pretty simple, it's just like just a simple read, nothing like complicated select and project and things like that. Um, the certificates we look at are just uh, signature, for signature keys, uh, we don't consider the activity related to um, encryption keys uh, because uh, the policies to deal with that, it's more complicated. The CA might have to store the key also for escrow purposes, so we forget about that. We use Delta CRL in the uh, basic model. We consider offline generation of full CRLs. And then we have signed messages. Every time components talk to each other, they sign the messages. And in this uh, model that you'll see, we don't consider communication services, which means all our analysis doesn't take into consideration that it takes some time for me to set up the connection to the array and for the array to set up the connection to the CA and so on. So that's part of the future work. Multi-class customer population, that means that we have, we distinguish customers that request uh, self-signed, uh, uh, that make a self-signed request to a for a certificate or for a revocation, uh, for a Delta CRL, uh, RA generated revocation and certificate request, and then we have a sixth class uh, for cross-certification request, which you'll see disappears pretty quickly because uh, it's not really a big load. Uh, we don't expect to have, we expect to have lots of users but there are not as many PKIs as there are users. So this cross-certification requests, even if they occur, they are not uh, occurring at a rate that can impact on the performance. And this is the model. Uh, if any of you is uh, familiar or has some, is familiar with uh, queuing networks, uh, 
can tell that it's a very simple model. It's nothing like we're not talking rocket science. It's, uh, it, it's a pretty simple model, but that's the way it is. All these arrows, uh, which are, don't distinguish uh, among the users, but uh, show you how the customers flow in the system. And as you can tell, the system is an open system. There is a, a, an open flow, for instance, into the CA, direct flow into the, C, uh, into the RA, excuse me, and into the CA, that's for self self-signed requests. This is for requests that come to the RA. Uh, access to the repository by the customers uh, to download CRLs uh, and, and so on. And then uh, replies back to the, uh, to the various um, servers. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the whole model. We'll start looking. At the basic model we did was we looked at the CA in isolation because the CA system is a system that has more components to it, which is what you see here. And it's very similar, uh, has the same structure as the RA model in isolation. So we have a CPU, we have a crypto uh, coprocessor, and we have a local disk. And this is the basic model we studied in, in isolation. Uh, I won't go into the details of these numbers, which are the numbers we use to parameterize the basic model. So the model that you, I just showed you, this one, all the different classes. Uh, you can see that the RA model, the parameters of the RA are relative only to these two classes because that's where the RA is involved and not in the rest. Um, these numbers, when you see the 300, these numbers are in milliseconds. 336, it means uh, that you do, uh, that you, that the, that two signatures are requested and there is one verification. This one does one signature, requests one signature, requires one signature, one verification, two and one, just one signature. This one is the heaviest, it requires two signatures and two verifications. So, uh, like I said, if any of you is familiar with um, uh, QE networks, you can immediately tell where the bottleneck is. The bottleneck is at the signing device. And um, <clears throat> we saw that they can be modeled as load independent. We found out, of course, that the bottleneck is at the uh, cryptographic device. This are the timings that we derived from the basic model to use in the complete model. So the complete model won't, doesn't see the details uh, that you see here, but it just sees uh, the uh, outcome of, those, of that mod of the previous one, which is basically the uh, time for the crypto processor. The rest uh, uh, kind of disappears. This is the complete model. In the complete model, um, we use five classes only because, like I said before, this type, the class six, which is the cross certification, accounts for just the minimum part of the, of the load. Uh, we also have some other little, uh, some more details, like we uh, assume that publishing a certificate requires six milliseconds, which is really uh, small time if you think of the time it takes the CA to do anything, and that the publication of a CRL is 12 milliseconds. Again, if you compare with these times, you realize that that's nothing. And that the main focus of anyone setting up that is interested in setting up a CA, uh, a PKI should be, of course, on the, on the certification authority. Um, these are more details uh, about the way we split the load. So we have only five classes. One class uh, has a fixed arrival rate. Why? Because it's a periodic event. So I know that it comes with so much regularity. And in the specific case, uh, we assume that delta CRLs are generated every 10 minutes, which gives uh, that arrival rate that you see up there. The remaining arrival rate it is split among the other four classes according to this uh, uh, set of equations. So the remaining arrival rate is, is spread. And depending on how those beta uh, values are, we will have 
more requests uh, for certificates or more revocations or a balanced system. So we start uh, uh, looking at a load that is typical of a system in the earlier stages. When I set up a PKI, I mostly do uh, generation of certificates. I mostly generate certificates. So we set up, the, we tune the parameters in order to have 82% of the total uh, load on the CA system, on the PKI. And if we forget the little bit, uh, the little load that it's uh, due to the Delta CRLs. So 82% is due to requests for uh, uh, new certificates and only 18% uh, 18% is due to um, revocation. Then we consider another case where slowly we go to uh, let's say more steady state kind of thing when we have less uh, requests for new certificates. What you see here is, uh, sorry for the, there is some Italian here that was left in the, in the picture, but it doesn't really, uh, it's not very different from the English in this case. Okay, what you see here is the response time on the uh, Y axis expressed in seconds. On the X axis, you see the arrival rate, again, requests uh, per second. The different colors are the different colors for the uh, various types of requests. So, <clears throat> um, in the top graph, um, you see that the, the point where the uh, response times uh, goes, um, well, starts going to infinity, although it's not really infinity, but it's like 20 seconds. Um, first of all, is almost the same for all classes, which means that except for the yellow one, which is the delta CRLs that yeah, can go maybe a little further, they, uh, the system saturates and uh, response times goes to infinity, increases a lot between 3 and 3.5 uh, global total arrival rate. If we have even more uh, certificate requests, we can't go that far. We, have, we saturate a little earlier. We saturate around three. And if we have more than three, we're just clearly going, going up very, very high. And this is the response time for each class. Um, why do we have this? Because, of course, uh, certificate requests, if you remember from the the, the previous uh, graph, not graph, but the tables I showed you were the heaviest operation on the CA. Now we consider if, uh, so we figure that, okay, uh, request for certificates is the heaviest. Does it make any difference if we do it through the RA or if we do it ourselves? Uh, so what we did is forget about, um, we forgot about the uh, revocations. Revocations, we only had uh, requests and we split the case. We have the case where, where the majority comes from the RA or the majority comes from uh, the users directly. And again, what we see is uh, there is a little difference actually and especially if you look at Okay, if you look at these two graphs, uh, CRLs that are in the top graph don't really, are not really affected. But the pink and the orange ones uh, uh, are, very, are very similar, sort of. In this case, uh, we can go a little further. We can go a little further, or, although we can't go really much further. We're gaining very, uh, very little in the, in the two cases. In this case, it's still a little better. And the CRL also <coughs> are not as affected as, uh, I mean, are way more affected in this case than in, uh, than in the other case. And we can go a little bit further. We'll be playing around this, these values uh, all around for all these graphs that I'll show you. I mean, we'll be in that range all the time, which, um, somehow is not bad because it means that the system is, is quite stable from a performance point of view. So what we've done for the generation of certificates, now we do it, uh, we do for the revocation. So we consider the same split, 
mostly revocation, uh, 82% or a little less, a little more balanced. Okay, revocations don't weigh as much and as such, we expect them to yield better performance. Better performance means we can push the load a little further to the right and still have reasonable performance, like response time below five seconds, which is pretty decent, I think. And it's the same thing for all classes. Um, <clears throat> in that case, 66% revocation means that we have more generations more requests for new certificates, which means that we have a system that is more loaded. And indeed, we have a lambda max, which is between 4 and 4.5 requests uh, per second. In this case, we can push things a little further because we have lighter load to, uh, we have a lighter load. Of course, then we do what? We get to the point where we balance the load uh, and some, with some numbers like the size, we define the size of the user population, we derive the size of the CRL, how, how much time it takes and blah, blah. And here we go. Now the system is more balanced. You can imagine 50 and 50, 50, 50 of one, uh, of both classes. We are, uh, the moment we push in more, uh, more generations, we uh, reduce the arrival rate that we can sustain. Let's see. Um, okay, now we know that with, now we're looking at a different thing. We fixed the load in a balanced way. We know that the maximum arrival rate is uh, like 3.5 requests per second in order to have a response time less than five seconds. Um, we want to see how uh, frequently we can generate delta CRLs, which guarantees us more up-to-date uh, information without affecting performance. Uh, so, <clears throat> and this is for both full CRLs and delta CRLs. So we'll see that five minutes for the first one and one minute for the second one is what we have. Okay, what do we have here? Uh, at the top graph, we have the uh, full, um, we fixed the, the rate at which uh, we generate full CRLs uh, to one every uh, four hours, which, kill, which yields uh, that very, very small number. It's a minimum, it's really a minimum load on the system. And what we see um, in the, okay, we have the usual bunch of lines all together for the usual classes that we've looked at. But we have that line on top uh, that is a little higher than everything, which is the response time for the full CRL generation. You can see that the, the, it, that class suffers more than the others. Although it's not really very, very frequent, the, you need to remember that the arrival rate for that class is fixed. Uh, what impact on uh, that class performance is the fact that we have all the other work to do. And the more we increase the work to do for the rest, uh, the, the worse the performance gets. In this case, uh, what we've done is uh, uh, the same setting for this bunch of classes. So it's like the one above. But on top, we do, uh, we try to change, uh, we change actually the uh, arrival rate for the uh, generation of the full CRLs, which means we generate more and more frequently uh, full CRLs. And you can see that the, that the response time spikes up much faster and clearly there is, there is more load. There is more load and the system slows down, uh, slows down more. Um, the other thing that you can notice is that in this case, uh, you can push in the case above at the top, you can push up to almost four. Here you can't really push up to four and have the same uh, performance level. You're just, you're way up a little more, a little faster. Uh, this part is a part that we did because in our, uh, according to our legislations, like I told you at the beginning, we have a legislation about digital signature and the PKI that, mm, uh, would be recognized, will be recognized by the law, have to have this feature. 
They have to sign the log file of their activities. Well, signing the log files of their activities uh, increases, uh, as you can see, the service times of the CA for the various classes to these huge numbers, because these numbers are in seconds. They're not milliseconds anymore. So that makes a big difference. Uh, again, we have different settings for the, for the load, but this is balanced load. Look at the curves. These are the performance of the system when logs are signed. And look at the uh, minimum arrival rate that we can sustain, of course, uh, compared to the arrival rate we can sustain if logs are not signed. So um, probably the legislators did not have any idea when they said log files should be signed and every single entry should be signed because signing every single entry is a real killer. You're not going to go beyond like 0 0.5 requests uh, per second. Enhancement, uh, you can change uh, the type of, um, uh, you can improve the way CRLs uh, or Delta CRLs are uh, issued. The, uh, Cooper, again, came up with this uh, sliding window over issued Delta CRLs, which means that you have Delta CRLs that are valid for so much time and you keep issuing more and more. So you have, uh, at a given point in time, you have even more than one Delta CRL that is valid and they overlap and you keep sliding. Uh, on the other side, you can issue a full CRL uh, uh, every 20 hours instead of like every four hours like we did before. Um, in this case, uh, we can see that the directory utilization increases, but the Lambda Max uh, is not really affected. Another variant that we try in is, uh, is this. Instead of publishing the full CRL or the Delta CRL, we sign a revocation and we publish it immediately. Uh, the users query the repository, the directory, um, directly, so they don't download the CRL. They just go on demand on whatever they need. Uh, with both with balanced and unbalanced load, uh, performance is uh, not that great because we have lost some. We remember that we were around like 3, 3.5. Now we are more in the range of 2.5 to 3. So this is probably not a good idea. Uh, these are the uh, graphs for the uh, two systems I just mentioned to you. So the first one is for over-issued CRLs with balanced load, and this one is when uh, revocations are signed individually. And like, as you can see, it just spikes up around between 2.5 uh, and 3. The other one goes a little further. And in this case, like, all, this is one thing, all uh, classes kind of behave the same, which means that um, you can simplify up to some point the model and even make it a single class model which will run even faster, which will give you, uh, which will still give you in spite of the fact that it's a single class uh, model, accurate pr uh, prediction for the performance. And finally, the online certificate status protocols. So the way things work is uh, the users query the OCSP responder. The OCSP responder is the only one to download the CRL, like I told you at the beginning, but it has to sign the replies to the user. Uh, however, although the, we, you can, I mean, we have two different parameters, like what the OCSP can do and what the, other, the rest of the system can do. Why do we separate the two things? Because uh, the OCSP is affected mostly by a type of traffic that the rest of the system won't see, which is the traffic for um, verification, status verification. So the top graph shows you the performance of a single OCSP. And then we did uh, an experiment uh, increasing the number of servers, of OCSP uh, servers, until we got like this flat line. It's like no matter now how much traffic, how much we increase the traffic, the OCSP uh, performance is not, is not affected. So it's, it's almost a flat line. It's not really completely flat, but the slope
slope is such that in, in a graph like this, uh, looks, like, looks like flat. Uh, what's left to do? Well, uh, first of all, the comparison with a system that is only, that doesn't use a cryptographic coprocessor, which is what uh, production systems that we have had a chance to uh, cooperate with um, do. They just use software. Include communication time because it might turn out that the botnet on the CA doesn't exist anymore. It might turn out that the bottleneck switches, the system bottleneck switches to the, to the network. We, we don't know, it might be that way. Add this other component, which is another component that our law uh, requires, timestamp authority. Uh, all the timestamps on the activities must be signed again. Uh, so there is like an official clock everyone can uh, refer to. And then uh, uh, complete the analysis with an estimate, uh, with an estimation of the total number of users that uh, allow the system to maintain a given, sustain a given performance. So there is quite, quite a bit of work still to do um, before we can uh, say, okay, this is, this is done. But as far as this talk go, this is done. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Sure. Yes. Why, why is that? It's because of the algorithms that are used, and we we measured, and from other measurements also we found in the in the literature we. Um, mm -hmm. Is that true? The public is always a smaller number than the private number. Mm. Yes. Yes, but uh, you're right. But uh, right now, I I I can't tell uh, I can't tell you why actually. But what we found uh, and what we relied uh, on was this uh, measurements from I think the SSL open group something uh, where they gave uh, um, like this 166 uh, milliseconds for signature and just four milliseconds for verification. Well, maybe when RSA generates the PCs, they always make the bigger one and the private one. Right? Probably, I, I don't know. It makes, yeah, it's, it's a very big difference. It's a significant difference. <laughs> yes. One and one. Yeah, we had what uh, the model looked like. We had one RA and one uh, and one CA. What accounts for the difference when you shifted the operations from the CA to the RA? What accounted for the difference? Uh, it's basically the nature of the we don't no, 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 we don't shift the operations from the uh, RA to the CA. It's just the type of message that the CA receives in case it's the RA that sends it or the directly the um, directly the user. You mean like the self-signed versus the RA generated? I thought you had a different slide there for if the uh, if the RA did some of the functions that the CA normally did. I don't know which functions it were. It's not really what the CA does. Uh, it's more like what the users uh, do if they send in something that is self-signed. The CA has to do. Uh, like double work, uh, uh, sort of in case some part of this work uh, is done by the array, it's like the verification of the identity of the user is done already by the array. So for the CA is faster. So that's why it takes a little longer if it's self-signed or if it's uh, RA signed. I have a question about some of the assumptions you made. Um, I'm not sure if I read the slide right. You said 20% revocation 
at some point we have like the, the split we had was like 18% 18, 18 uh, revocations versus uh, um, 82 or like 12 and 88 maybe. 20% of the load was revocation. At some point, yes, 20% of the load is revocation and, and it's split between self-signed revocations and RA-signed revocation, but it's like 20% revocation and 80% uh, um, generations. Publication of a CRL every four hours, is that common? That seems the, uh, the full CRL every four hours, and then you have the updates, which are the Delta CRLs, every 10 minutes. That's pretty common. That's what, uh, like, standard uh, measurements, well, measurements, uh, standard assumptions uh, that have been used also in this other study, is the one I mentioned by Cooper. And it seems a reasonable thing, although 10 minutes might be uh, quite a long time if you're relying on, like, for instance, banking transactions. You can't really wait for 10 minutes uh, before you can get your, uh, even just your, uh, I don't know, your Amazon book uh, request or the out. But that's a pretty, a fairly common assumption. You're welcome. Again, regarding the assumption, my question is, what are the hardware uh, which is being used for calculating the processing time in the model? Uh, we use times for, uh, right now, I can't remember off the top of my head, but if you're interested, I can give you the, the exact references for the type of, like, the um, coprocessor, the cryptographic coprocessor, which is basically the critical thing because everything else is, is pretty slow, so uh, it's pretty fast compared to that one. Excuse so what me. is the background you're saying when you have to log on? Because it's writing to hard disk, that's, that's taking more time? Uh, no, it's just calculating the signature. It's not really doing the operation on the disks or anything. It's just the, the CPU time to compute the signature that, it, that takes some time. So what is the difference when you said, as per the ITLE log, you have to do some logon, logging? Mm -hmm. the, the signed logging? It's, it's still, it has to be signed. Yeah, it has to be signed. That's the thing that every, th well, they keep logs of what they do. Like, I signed this certificate at this time, but then uh, uh, in a regular, uh, in a system that not necessarily compliant with our law, the Italian law, you just write your logbook like any other logbook. In our system, you would have to sign each entry of the logbook, digitally sign it, and then takes more time. Because you may have to do more than one signature for each transaction. Like if I do two or three things, I will have two or three entries in the, in the logbook, even for like a revocation or a generation, which means like every, every single thing that the CA does has to be written on the log. And if you write it on the log, you have to sign it. What's the idea behind that? Uh, the fact that if Digital signatures have legal value. You have to be able to trace back as much as possible and guarantee as much as possible what's been done. That's the idea. And if you have like just uh, manual signatures, the guarantee is in the fact that you are signing. But if you uh, move the trust in the system, I guess they are trying to, well, I, I'm, I'm guessing what the idea of the legislators uh, were they're trying to put as much trust uh, in, the, in the technical system as they can, given that they don't really know how it works. <laughs> and they think that the more you increase this thing of, okay, whatever you do, you sign it, and it as a guarantee. It's a guarantee that is done correctly. Do they use a different, what key do they use to, do they have special logging keys? Uh, I don't know if they have special logging keys. I think it's the same. Is the same key the CA used to sign? So it's always the same key. And the thing is, you can't even uh, have multiple CAs doing your work, like using a parallel system to do the work, because of again, because of uh, legislative uh, constraint. So it has to be a single CA doing things if you want a CA that is uh, compliant with the law, so that whatever it signs uh, will be recognized and have uh, legal value. If you are setting up a PKI and you're not particularly concerned about legal value of what you're signing, you don't have to do it. 
I mean, you don't have to have like this lo this, the signed logs and things like that. It's much uh, lighter on the performance uh, side. doesn't have anything to do with, with um, what you did, but on the logging, um, are there people now working on figuring out how to mine these logs and go, and this must be a huge problem. Oh yeah, I guess. I don't know of any work uh, about mining these logs. Or, or auditing them. And yeah, well, because that's the part that um, I don't think they realized what they were doing when they asked for signed logs. The monster. <laughs> yeah, the monster, exactly. ideas about other aspects of PKI, things like human computer interface uh, courses. Uh, so anybody who's interested can come down and, and chat afterwards. I'd like to, to thank her for giving thank a very you. interesting talk. <laughs> thank you very much.